All right, let's open our Bibles tonight. We're only going to have one chapter tonight, Genesis chapter 42. Uh, for sure, my favorite part of this book of Genesis, and there's a lot of favorite parts, but are, are certainly these last nine chapters. The lessons that I find there, at least for me, are, are unparalleled, unsurpassed. And I hope you'll be with us for the next several weeks to, to pick up on them as well, because they are, to me, some of the greatest lessons that we can learn in our, to, to help us in our everyday walks with the Lord. Jacob had four wives, 12 sons. His favorite wife, Rachel, gave him two sons, Joseph, the fourth patriarch in our list of folks that began to lead us to the nation of Israel. And then Benjamin, who she bore, and as she gave birth to him, she died. Jacob favored these two boys, his favorite wife's children with him. Joseph was given by a, his dad a, a coat of many colors. It, it signified his authority and position, and uh, it gave him a place of prominence of, of, above his brothers that, that didn't go very well. Um, he was able to report to his dad his, his brother's work habits. You can read about that in chapter 37. He even was given by the Lord a, a dream about how his, his own brothers and, and family would one day bow before him, and he was naive enough to tell it to them, and that didn't go well either. But one day he was sent by his father, Jacob, to see how the boys were doing. They were tending the sheep some 50 miles away in a place called Shechem, where some bad things had happened to the family and, and to the city. Joseph couldn't find them there, but he finally found them 62 miles away in a place called jo Dothan. And the boys thought, well, gosh, this is far enough away from home that we can do anything we want to this kid that we don't like. And so they wanted to get rid of him. Reuben, who was the oldest son, talked them out of killing him. But that was uh, at least on the table. But while Reuben was away, we're not sure where, uh, Joseph was placed in an empty cistern. His brothers ate lunch while he sat and wept and asked for their mercy and didn't find it. A passing Midianite trading uh, caravan came by and, and Judah suggested, well, let's sell him into slavery. And they did. They got 20 pieces of silver. Reuben came back. He was grieved with their actions, but not enough to not take the dough. They took some goat's blood. They put it on that coat of many colors that had been his possession went home to dad and said, look, we found this along the way. Is this your son's? In the pockets of these boys, that little piece of silver rattled around. But Joseph was 17 or 18 years old when he found himself in Egypt, sold to the, uh, into the house of a captain who had been made a eunuch, was a, a leader in Pharaoh's army. And for the next 10 years, Joseph served faithfully. Terrible place to be, certainly didn't deserve it. But that's where he found himself. And during that time, he faithfully served the Lord. He was, he was, for a young man, unbelievably convinced that God was good. And God took care of him and blessed everyone around him, including the family that he was serving. And God blessed him. And then one day, this lustful wife of, 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 uh, of this man was, was hitting up on Joseph for quite some time. Joseph was turning her away. One day she, she made a move. <laughs> he ran out of the house. She accused him of rape. Her husband um, got him in prison. We, we mentioned that Potiphar could have had him killed. That was the law for, for the Egyptians. But I'm not sure he was completely convinced that Joseph was at fault. But in any event, Joseph ends up in 28 years of old in prison. Still hadn't done anything but serve the Lord. He was there for a year serving faithfully. The head of the prison made Joseph number one man in charge. He ran the prison. One day, a year or so in, the butler and the baker of Pharaoh's were imprisoned for whatever happened. Maybe they try, somebody tried to poison the Pharaoh, we don't know. But they were entrusted to Joseph's care, and one night they both had a dream. They were both sorrowful. They both told Joseph the dream. He said, well, you know, I can't interpret dreams, but the Lord can. Let's see what God will say. And as they told him the dreams, Joseph said to the butler, you're going to live, be found innocent. And the baker you're not going to make it. You're not going to get out of here. And so Joseph asked the butler, when that indeed became the case, to put in the good word for him with Pharaoh. Look, I didn't do anything. Maybe you could hear my case. But the minute he got out, he forgot about Joseph and that horrible three days in, in prison or whatever. And, and he got out. And, and he forgot. A couple of years later, in chapter 41, 
Pharaoh had a dream, and it was a horrible dream, a couple of different ways that it was, was seen in that dream, but he, he went to his soothsayers, and they had him a clue. You didn't want to tell the Pharaoh the wrong thing, so they said nothing. We don't know. But it was about that time that the butler remembered this fellow in jail that had interpreted his dream. He said, there was a fellow named Joseph. He helped me when you had locked me up a couple of years ago. So they summoned him, and, and again, God gave Joseph the interpretation how there were going to be seven years of very tremendous fruitfulness in Egypt, that money was going to roll in and the, the, the crops were going to grow bigger than ever and sales were going to be great, but then it was going to be followed by seven years of very severe famine. And he said, the, the, the dreams are the same. God has warned you of what is coming. And it, it, Joseph said, if I can give you some advice, save up now so that we'll be ready when those seven years come. And, and Pharaoh said, who can be in charge as wise as you? We'll put you in charge. And, and Joseph went from prison to pinnacle in a matter of, of, of hours. From the depths to the heights, in, in a couple of moments, he, he becomes vice pharaoh, if you will. And seven years of plenty come, and, and they store away all of the goods, and at least one year of, of famine comes before we get to chapter 42, and Joseph is now at least 38 years old. He has spent more than half of his life locked up, or, or at least enslaved, and now in a very prominent position, but he's been in, in Egypt more than half of his life. He's been faithful to serve. And now for these last nine chapters, after all of that time, 21 years of, of heartache, if you will, in many ways, Joseph gets to find out what God's plans were all along. Now, I don't know if you'd go along with anything in your life. If the Lord said to you, 21 years from now, you're, you're going to understand all of this. We usually don't last three days. 21 years, and not a crack in the armor, not a, not a, not a cynical comment, not a, not a questioning heart, not an not a angry spirit. Joseph, just wherever he was, as a slave, as a prisoner, and now serving the Pharaoh as, as the second most powerful man in the world, Joseph finds himself faithfully serving the Lord. But he knows the Lord, and if you know the Lord, then you can rest in the Lord. And, and J, Joseph's legacy is, is really that resting in the, in the God that you know. It's an amazing story. Since much of the narrative and what we're going to read tonight lays out the biblical truths that we are going to learn in practice, there is a couple of, I think, lessons that we ought to keep in mind. I, I remember reading a couple of years ago, uh, Winston Churchill did a, uh, gave a, a speech at his alma mater, it was in like in, in 1941 or something. It's been a long time ago, but but one of the things he kept repeating to this group of students, he said, "Never give up. Never in things small or in things great. Never in things that are large or petty, unless it's a matter of conscience. Never give up and never give in." And I thought, that's Joseph. This guy never gave up. And he never give in. How resilient is a faith that knows the Lord? All of these years, and I would, I would bet you, although maybe you don't want to bet, I would bet you, though, that, that he had no clue as to what God was doing. He just knew God, but he didn't know what God was up to. And yet he embodied that scripture in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. We know. We know by experience. We know by trial and error. We know because we've proved it to be so that, that God works everything together for good. I know you know that verse. The question would be, do you know it on a personal level? To where when things go sideways for you tomorrow you're able to say to yourself with great confidence, oh, God's doing something for good, rather than what we usually do, which is complain. It is used by us sometimes, that verse, to resign ourselves to situations we can't change. Things don't work out, and so we say, well, God works all things together for good. But that's not the way that verse is intended to be applied. It, it is intended to bless you so that you say to yourself, this is good. And everyone says, you're crazy. And you say, oh, no, 
my God does only good things. In fact, the words work together, all things work together, is the Greek word for synergy. Synergy is, is, is a word that means various elements produce together a greater result than they could ever produce on their own. What the Lord is telling us there is that whatever is going on around us, he is going to use every circumstance, every difficulty, every trial to accomplish something good in your life. Though many times I think we fail to view them as beneficial, but if they're difficult things, God works all things together for good. Whether they are harmful or a setback or a disappointment, it is all beneficial, planned by God, brought about by him to give good results to you. If you really believe that, you'll never complain again. Why should you? It all works together for good. Oh, but I don't like that. Yeah, but he's doing it for your benefit. I don't care. Joseph and we are going to see Romans 8.28 proven out over the next several weeks how by faith Joseph had lifted out for 21 years now. We'll read back at, at, the, at the last chapter, chapter 50, I think for, verse 18, that his brothers, when they finally came and fell down on their faces, really to apologize and really to come clean. And they said, we'll, we'll just be your servants. And they were worried because Jacob had died and the boys thought, now he's going to get even with us. Dad's out of the way now. And Joseph said, look, you don't need to be afraid of me. I, I don't stand in the place of God. I know what you meant to do to me was evil. But God meant it for good. So that he could bring about, as it is this day, a saving of many people alive. So look, don't be afraid. I'll provide for you and for your kids. And he comforted them, spoke kindly to them. Joseph believed that all things work together for good. R.A. Torrey, who was a great Bible commentator, wrote on his Bible in Romans 8, 28, um, it is a soft pillow for a weary heart. If you're really tired of the way things are going, or at least you're tired of the way you respond, then come and rest in the fact that, you, that God's in charge. Would it be easier to read the verse if it said, most things work together for good? It would be easier, right? Or many things work together for good. It doesn't say that. It says all things work together for good. When Job was struggling in, in, the, in the throes of God seemingly you know, taking his hands off of his life, all the things that had gone wrong. Job wrote in chapter 23, or he said in chapter 23, I think maybe Moses wrote it, but that, that's a different study. Um, I'm going forward, but he's not there. And I look backward and I can't perceive him. When he works on the right, I don't behold him. When he works on the right hand or on the left hand, I don't perceive him. When he works on the right hand, I don't see him. But I know this, he says. I know the way that I take, that when he has tested me, I'm going to come forth like gold. I don't know where he is. I can't see him. I don't even, I can't even feel like he's around, but I know this. I know this. When he's done, I'm going to be the better for it. Great insight. He would write 10 chapters earlier, chapter 13, verse 15. Though he slay me, slay me, yet I will trust in him. Though he slay me, I will Trust in him. That's Joseph's, that's Joseph's testimony to us. What is your limit in trusting God? Where do you stop trusting him? As long as you're in good health, he's a good God. As long as you have a faithful wife or husband, he's a good God. As long as your children are successful, he's a good God. As long as you can maintain your standard of living, but what if all of those things fall apart? And he works all things together for good. Then what? Joseph knew no situation where he failed to trust God's good plan and he thrived everywhere he went. And now he goes from the pit of the jail cell to the pinnacle of, 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 of life. He becomes extremely wealthy. He, he, he has power that you can only dream of and yet it doesn't affect him at all. He continues to serve God faithfully. He's not corrupted by his promotion. 
because he has come to know that God is in charge. And whatever position he finds himself in, he wants to be sure the Lord is on it. But I think you keep that Romans 8, 28 in mind as you go through these next nine chapters, because it is really the personification of one person who absolutely believed it and practiced it in his life. In chapter 42, we're getting there, aren't we? There we are, almost. Uh, sorry. Early in the chapter, we, we turn from Joseph in Egypt, who we have just told is now in charge. The seven years of, of plenty have come, and now there was at least one year of famine that's really besieging the world. But we turn from Joseph in Egypt back to Canaan and, and back to Joseph's family. For, for the past many years, if you've been reading through the scriptures, the only insight we've had from home is chapter 38, where Judah had had that horrible situation with Tamar and how he had lost two sons and she had become pregnant and now he had been, she had given birth to two twins, or two twins, I should say, with him. That's all we really know of, of home life uh, until now. We read in verse 1, when Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, why don't you go, why do you sit and look at one another? And he said, indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Now go down to that place and buy for us there that we might live and not die. The, the famine had spread to Canaan. The people were running out of food. A couple of things I think you can mark down. Number one, just because you're God's people, that doesn't make you immune from the sufferings around you. There's no unconditional guarantee that you won't face suffering from an earthquake or a tornado or a flood or a fire or a pandemic for that matter. Jacob had money to buy food, but notice his boys, and they're not very active, sitting around, Jacob's old, staring into space, needing to be encouraged to act sensibly. Hey, we're out of food, Ben, what are we gonna do? How about you go down and buy some in Egypt? Quit sitting around. Now we know, looking back, or looking over the thing, if you will, that God was orchestrating a meeting that none of them could ever have imagined. But Jacob's family continues to be very dysfunctional. All of these men, no one seems to lift a finger to relieve the problem. And finally, old Jacob has to kind of kick him in the backside. Come on, what are you guys doing? We're told in verse 3, so Jake, Jake, uh, sorry, Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, lest some calamity would befall him. Now, this was a dangerous trip. You know, I know we read it very quick, but it was, you know, miles and miles through unprotected wilderness, kind of, carrying a lot of money in a time of famine. It would have taken six weeks or so to do a round trip. It was 265 miles one way. Meanwhile, all of the boys, except for young Benjamin, who's in his 20s now, would have abandoned the farm, if you will. So pretty much left Jacob unprotected. The flocks would need care. But they were going to go to Egypt, not a friendly place. They would have to talk to some guy that they couldn't pronounce his name. You can read about it there in verse 45 of the last chapter. And it was Joseph, but they didn't know that. So they load up their donkeys with a lot of dough, and they head down this 265-mile trip to Egypt to buy grain, with one brother missing, that other favorite son of Jacob's that Rachel bore him as she passed away, Benjamin, not risking his life. 23 years old, I guess would be right. Now, a couple of things. Number one, this is a big mistake on Jacob's part. Not because he loves him, because he should love him, and I would think that he would cling, cleave to him all the more. But this young man is not allowed to simply live his life. <laughs> you know, there's no trust in God from his parent. And you find uh, sometimes when people lose kids or spouses, it changes the way they live. They stop living. They, they just kind of button up and, and life goes away. They, they become overprotective or they become very fearful. You can't live like that. God is in charge. But he did. I'm not letting Benjamin go, uh, he dies, I die. It's my boy. He was willing to give up the other ten, mind you. We are told in verse 5 that the, the sons of Israel went to buy grain amongst those 
who were also traveling. They joined a caravan, for the famine was in the land of Canaan, and Joseph was governor over the land. It was he who sold to all of the people of the land, and Joseph's brothers came, and they bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. And I wonder if Joseph didn't go, aha, my dream was correct. Anyway, Joseph was handling the sale. The boys come with respect and out of fear. They didn't recognize their brother. He recognized them. I have no idea what went through his mind. I wish we could have been told, you know, vengeance is mine. I will respect. Thank you, Lord, for bringing them here on their knees. There's no hint of, of bitterness or that kind of attitude. He's going to deal pretty roughly with his brothers over the next little while. But if, if you read carefully, he does so only because he wants to know how sorry they are, what might have become of his little brother, and how his dad doing. He wanted to see, was there a measure of repentance there? I mean, this has been 21 years since they sold him down the road and pocketed a few dollars and walked away and lied to dad who's been bro brokenhearted and life hasn't been the same since. So he's kind of rough on them, but, you know, he has things that he wants to learn. Yet through it all, Joseph will have a heart of forgiveness, not of vengeance. He won't try to get retribution. He's not angry. He's brokenhearted. He loves them. He'll bring them to himself. But, but for Joseph, he, here, here's what Joseph gets. God has done something phenomenal here. He didn't do it. He was just faithful where he was at, and God came to him. True forgiveness separates the men from the boys. <laughs> and it is certainly a major theme in Joseph's life, uh, especially as you get to the end of the book. You know, when you can look someone in the eye who has hurt you deeply and on purpose and still love them and forgive them and treat them with the mercy of God that Joseph did, that's a huge step towards spiritual maturity. And you certainly find it in Joseph's life. It is easy to love those who love you. People do that all the time. But to love those who have treated you like this? In the Sermon on the Mount there in chapter 5, Jesus would say, I, you know, you, you've heard them say an eye for an eye and a, a tooth for the tooth, but I would say to you, do not resist an evil person if he slaps you on the right cheek off from the other one. If he sues you to take away your coat, give him your overcoat or your tunic and, and your cloak. If, if he makes you go one mile, just go two miles. Whatever he asks of you, give it to him. And, and if he wants to borrow from you, don't turn away from him. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But here's what I say to you. I mean, it's an entirely different thing, isn't it? And Joseph, he's not just, he's not just hanging in there. He's living the godly life. He is standing where the Lord wanted him to stand. You know, this is kind of like, you know, this separates the minor leaguers from the big leagues. <laughs> Joseph forgives all the time, big time. But he does provide some tests, if you will, to prove the repentance of his brothers, to, re to gather information about Je Benjamin and his dad, to eventually get them all over there so he can take care of them because he's, he's in control of the world's food supply, if you will, at the time. We told in verse 7, that Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to, to them, and he spoke roughly to them, and he said to them, where do you come from? They said, we're from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him, and he remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them. And he said to them, you are spies. You have come to, seek the, or to see the nakedness of the land. We are told twice here that they didn't recognize Joseph, but he recognized them. Joseph, in his mind, put together the vision that he had, a uh, dream years earlier, 21 years. He was 17 or 18, now he's 38. Uh, he rules in, in Egypt. By the way, just go any, anything to do with Egypt society at that time, Egyptian society, and you know that, that Egyptian practice was not to leave a hair on your face, especially those who were pharaohs and overseers. There's no hair on your head. There's no, there's, no, there's no eyebrows. In fact, they would only glue on a fake goatee made of uh, uh, horse hair, lacquered to a real stiffness. Maybe you've seen some of those. But that was pretty much, you know, they were the coolest. That's the coolest look right there. So uh, he speaks to these Hebrews, according to verse 23, through an interpreter. So they don't hear his voice. He speaks Egyptian 
while wearing ro royal robes. There, there's no way they could have recognized him so many years later. And Joseph speaks roughly to them, like I said, to ascertain num uh, news about their family. He, wanted, he wants the information about his brother, about his father. He accuses them of coming out of Canaan to be spies, to find out about food, maybe to come back later to raid the place or, or to bring attack. So he speaks rougher to them. And we read in verse 10 that they said to him, oh, no, 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 my Lord. But we're your servants and we've come here to buy food. We are all one man's sons and we are honest men. Your servants are not spies. We are honest men. Really? Sold Jacob, lied to their father, let him grieve for years. Thank you for your honesty. Well, Jeff, Joseph wants more information. But he said to them, no, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, no, 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 your servants are 12 brothers, the, the son of one man in the land of Canaan. In fact, the youngest is with our father, and one is no more. Well, that's true. Benjamin was home. Jacob was alive. Joseph was dead, or so they said. But Joseph said to them, it is as I said to you, your, your spies. In this manner you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. So send one of you and let him bring your brother and you shall be kept in prison that your words may be tested to see whether they have any truth or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And so he's put them all together in the prison for three days. Joseph kept putting on the pressure, puts all 10 of them in jail for three days. We'll test to see if your story is true. We'll send one of you back, and then without mercy or so it seemed, he threw these scoundrels in prison. These are bad guys. They had slain a city's inhabitants in anger. They had sold their brother in anger. They had made their dad suffer in anger. They're terrible guys. I don't know if he put them in the same cell he was in for three years, but he left them in there for three days. But they didn't know that. For all they knew, this was it. This is kind of like going to a foreign country and they arrest you for something and make something up and you never see the light of day. Throw away the key. Yet after three days, Joseph returns to them and he has a better offer to them, verse 18. Joseph said to them after, on the third days, do this and live, for I fear God. If you're honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to, your, to our present house, your present house, but you go and carry grain for the famines of your houses and bring your youngest brother to me so that your words can be verified, and then you shall not die. And they did so. Interesting that Joseph would say to his brothers, I fear Elohim. Now, that should have been a clue to them, I think, or they, somebody should have picked up and I go, what did he just say? Because that wasn't an Egyptian God. That's the Jewish God. I'm going to keep, not all of you, I'm just going to keep one of you, and I'm going to send the rest of you back, take your food, home to your families, but bring your brother back here, then I'll know that you're telling the truth. And I'll release your brother, and no one will have to die. Or in other words, you don't bring him back, he dies. It's a lot of pressure. And they said to one another, verse 21, we are truly guilty concerning our brother. For we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we wouldn't hear him, therefore this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them and said, did I not I tell you or say to you, do not sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen, therefore his blood is, not being, is now being required of us. Now, get the picture. In their native tongue, in Hebrew, these boys were speaking to one another, not believing anyone could understand them. After 21 years of carrying this dark secret around in their hearts, this guilt was still destroying them. They were anticipating, sooner or later, this is going to catch up with us. Here is a sign of trouble and these men associate the trouble with the retribution of God, the justice of God. Guilt is, I think, what we all, all like to get rid of, wouldn't we? Who likes to be guilty? 
Guilt is a horrible outlook. Yet our brains are remarkably made by the Lord because it's kind of like a, a computer. It stores vast amounts of information. And even when you'd like to put things out of your mind, usually you can't. It keeps resurfacing over and over again. Unless you get to be my age, and then it's just a name that you're worried about forgetting. You've probably seen someone, and you recognize their face, but you don't remember their name. And then somehow, a week later, driving down the road, out of nowhere, oh, that's who it is. It just kind of appears. Or some external kind of event stimulates your memory. For, for me, I'm growing up in the 60s and listening to a lot of rock music, I can associate a lot of events in my life with the, with the songs that were there. Uh, and I could almost tell you where I was or what was going on, especially when that music, you know, if I hear that music now. And some of it's pretty good, some of it not so good. But, but here are these boys, you know, they're, they're now in big trouble. They're, they're there just to get food, but this has not gone well. This, is, this has gone sideways. And they begin to vividly talk about something that happened two decades earlier. That guilt that just, you know, sometimes they can push it out of their minds. But look, it doesn't take much before it keeps screaming back up to the surface. And they begin to describe in, in very sad, but in very clear detail, how, how Joseph had suffered and cried out from that, from that hole that they'd thrown him out. Please don't do that to me. Come on, guys, stop kidding. I, I don't want to do, you know. And they, they begged, or he did. He pleaded. They ate lunch, we read, and ignored his cry. Now we're being punished. This is payback. This is what we deserve. Did you know that our U.S. Treasury Department has a conscience fund? Every year it takes in millions of dollars from people who decided they should have paid their taxes. They don't ask any questions, but they'll cash the check. The police still hold days of turning in weapons. No questions asked, just turn them in doesn't have a serial number, fine, we'll take it. Emotional guilt can cripple you, but spiritual guilt can either save you or drive you to eternal judgment. One or the other. And these guys emotionally had been tormented by their behavior. Whatever they had hoped to accomplish, it certainly wasn't worth it, the exchange. But there's that scripture where, where, where David writes in Psalm 32, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, and whose sin is covered. Blessed the man to whom the Lord will not impute his iniquity. That's the guilt-free life we want. And, and, and that's really the only way we get that is we, we turn to the Lord. Here, their, their conscience, their memory, and their reasoning is, is married to their past sin. They can't separate the two, nor should they. And so their presence and their... their their day-to-day -day suffering is still attached to something that happened years earlier. And, and the only solution for, for guilt like that of sin is the shed blood of Jesus, who will cleanse us from our failures. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 7, 8, 9, he is faithful to cleanse us from all of our sins and to, and to cleanse us from all our sins. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth isn't in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's good. That's a, that's a eraser that removes all, every spot. That's what we want. That's how, you, that's how you get rid of your guilt. He cleans the slate. Reuben here mentions to the boys that back in chapter 37, he had spoken up against killing him and, and it seems, tried to dissuade them, at least in part, from, from going forward to, to harm him. But, look, he took his share of the money, went home and lied to his father. Judah had stopped the others talking about murder to suggest selling him. But notice here in verse 21, they confess their sins because they're guilty. And, and, and look, the first step ever for everyone, for anyone in getting saved, is to confess your sin. It's the first step towards salvation. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see God. you got to get to the point where you just realize your guilt. 
so that God can then offer you a way out. These men had shoved all of this under the rug, uh, pushed it away in their consciences, acted like it had never happened, but it couldn't stay hidden until they repented. It couldn't be fixed until they repented. In fact, to chapter 50, which we just read a minute ago, when, when J Jacob died and they were so fearful that now Joseph was going to hang them, <laughs> you know, they were still, out of, uh, uh, they're still not sure of the, the mercy of God that jo Joseph would share with them. But things are changing for them. It was coming out. They were talking about it to one another. There was this collective wickedness and this sin that had been repressed for two decades in this family. Well, Joseph is listening because he can speak this language. We read in verse 23, but they did not know that Joseph understood them. For he spoke to them through an interpreter, and he had to turn away from them and begin to weep. And then he returned to them and he talked with them and he chose Simeon to keep and bound him before their eyes to send back to jail and then sent the other boys on their way. So Joseph is listening and his heart hears their guilt and he can't contain himself. This might have been the first time he learns that Judas's or, or Reuben, Reuben's position had been to, to not go down this road or, or Judah had stopped his murder. It caused him to weep. <laughs> he went to another room. He couldn't contain himself. We're going to find Joseph, actually, this is the first of six different times between here and the end of the book that Joseph is weeping over the things that he learns or the things that he hears. So he takes uh, Simeon, and by the way, Simeon was the cruelest dude of them all. If you go to Gen uh, Genesis chapter 49 and read of Jacob's words for his boys, and we'll get there when we get there, uh, on his dead deathbed, Simeon is not coming out smelling like a rose. So he took the cruelest guy, put him in chains, and he sent people on their way with tears in his eyes. Now, I want you to notice something. We, we've talked a lot about Joseph's faithfulness, but that didn't mean Joseph didn't hurt. Because here, this poor man at 38 years old can't contain himself. He has to excuse himself, and he has to go cry. He's kept it before the Lord, but that doesn't mean it didn't hurt or it wasn't difficult for him. And it would come out from time to time. I have discovered that as I get older, I can get more weepy. Well, I've got it under control. Don't you worry right now. I remember when Pastor... Ralph started to come out with us teaching plays, and he'd cry a lot. And I'd go, come on, dude, seriously? David resolves. He started crying. Now I watch, like, some shows that go, oh, and Debbie goes, oh, you're crying. Go, no. Oh, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what causes you to weep, but folks tonight going to hell that need to know Jesus should. And... For Joseph, it was, it was the years of hurt. He, he, he couldn't fix it. He trusted the Lord with it. But that didn't mean it was easy. It broke his heart. But he heard the, the, at least the sounds of, of remorse, at least in part. We read in verse 25 that Joseph then commanded that they fill their sacks with grain and then to restore to every man his money in his sack and to give them perversion for their journey, which they did. So he loaded their donkeys, or so they loaded their donkeys with grain, and they departed from there. And as one of them opened his sack to give his do uh, donkey some food at the encampment, he saw his money, and there it was in the mouth of the sack. And he said to his brothers, my money has been restored, there it is in my sack. And now their hearts failed them, and they became more afraid. And they began to say to one another, what is this that God has done to us? This wasn't getting any easier. Joseph sends them home. Bags filled with food, money that they had brought to purchase the good. You know, at the first oasis to feed the animals, they, they, they discover at least the money in one bag. And their guilt seemed even worse, their, their sin even heavier. What's God doing to us now? Joseph had paid for their supplies, returned their money. Maybe they would need it to return again to get money. They went home, looking over their shoulders, not feeling much better, feeling much worse. We read in verse 29, when they 
went to Jacob, their father, when they got home in the land of Canaan. They told him all that had happened to them and say, the man who was the Lord of that land spoke roughly to us, took us for spies of the country. We said to them, we're honest men, we're not spies. We have 12 brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. And then this man, the Lord of the country, said to us, by this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me, take food for the families of your households, and be gone. Bring your youngest one to me so I might know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men, and I will grant your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. So they arrive home. They tell their dad their, their fate, their, their plight. They can't really tell them his, their fear, which they've been talking about all the way home for the last two or three weeks, that their Lord was getting even with them. And Jacob sits bewildered. Where's Simeon? They got him. We read in verse 35 that he, then it happened as they emptied their sacks that they surprisingly, each man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they saw, and when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were even greatly afraid. And, and Jacob, their father, said to him, you have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. Now you want to take Benjamin? All of these things are against me. Jacob is overwhelmed with sorrow yet again. Joseph's gone. Simeon's gone. Now you want Benjamin? And then what's the answer? No way. Everything is against me. That's the antithesis of all things work together for good. It's the ab absolute other side of the story. Faith breaks down. Despair sets in. Jacob has lost his favorite son, which he hasn't really grieved about, at least not enough to get over it. He's not living, he's surviving. Now another peril. And the demand that his other favorite son be taken back to Egypt. Jacob sees none of God's plans here, by the way. Joseph hadn't seen them, but he trusted him. Jacob, unfortunately, is in that position where, where he... He doesn't see it at all. The portion that Jacob saw, he hated. He needed to look up. He hadn't. Our light affliction, Paul would write, which is much for a moment, will work in us in an exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we don't look at the things that are seen but the things which are not seen. Because what we see is temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. He needed to look up, but he didn't. Everything is against me. Joseph, all things work together for good. Two extremes. Joseph, Jacob had not grieved well for Joseph. Two decades later, he's still overwhelmed by us. He's not a healthy guy spiritually. If he had known what was coming, that his son was alive, that he would be holding him in his arms not too far from now, that his family would be taken care of through this famine in a glorious way, that that rough lord in Egypt was none other than his son. Here's what happens, though. When you don't know that God is in charge and you rest in the fact that he does everything well, what you get instead is this. You get fear and despair. You are left with the information that you can see or analyze or calculate. But that doesn't figure onto a heart of faith and, and trust in the Lord's love. If he had heard them say, or the Lord speak, let me work it out, boys. I've got a glorious plan for you. Wait till you see who's the boss. You're going to like him. And forgiveness is going to come to your boys. And restoration is going to come to your family. They would have had a different outlook. But now it was guilt for the boys and no hope for the father. Sometimes when God is wanting to do glorious things in our lives, what, what, we, what he hears from us is Jacob. The whining, the complaining, the lacks of faith. Notice what Jacob, he used the word all. <laughs> Not, hey, I've had a rough couple of years. No, no, all things are against me. The Lord likes to use the word all too. He said in Psalm 137, 
How precious are your thoughts towards me, O God. If I could just number them, they'd be more than the sands of the sea. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, he tells us in Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Thoughts of good, not of evil, to give you a future, to give you a hope. I know my thoughts, they're good ones. Oh no, everything's against me. Reuben, at a loss, in verse 37, speaks to his father and said, look, kill my two sons. If I don't bring Benjamin back to you, put him in my hands, I'll bring him back to you. And he said, my son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, he is left alone. If any calamity should befall him on the way in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Reuben's offer was silly, but he didn't know what to say. Guilt will do that. Let me give you my two sons as collateral. Yeah, that's helpful. To Jacob, the, stop, the suffering would stop right here. Simeon would stay in jail. We're, so, we're sacrificing Simeon. But we're not going to go back there with Benjamin. Next week, we'll continue. Shall we pray? Father, it is uh, unbelievable and, and certainly a lesson that we, we want to, to take to heart, that, that you made a promise to us that all things work together for good in the lives of those who are walking with you, that there is nothing that comes to us or that you allow in our lives that is beyond your control or outside of your plan. And much like Joseph, we might live for years and not see it might really just go with what we've seen, like Jacob, be moved with fear and anger, frustration, defeat. Or, or maybe we're just blinded to your work because like the boys, we're just guilty in our sin and we've never come to you to see about forgiveness and, more, and to be washed and cleansed and made new. Either way, to those who know the Lord, all things work together for good. Those who walk with God can can rest in that truth. Well, no matter what comes up tomorrow, all things work together for good. It, it, it should be our mantra. It should be, it should be a, a clause in our, in our morning prayers. Thank you, Lord, that today everything's going to work together for good. And Father, that you tell to, to teach us not just to know the verse, but to live it. And to begin to consider Joseph's plight in these 21 years of, of just grief and, and, and betrayal and separation from family and, and, and a life that was hard. And yet in every place we find him faithful and God's blessing and God's blessing and more of God's blessing. And Joseph eventually is able to name his two children with his wife there. And one of them is that God has, for, has allowed me to forget my sorrow and instead has brought me great fruit. Teach us what it means to live out. God does all things well. Teach us that, Lord. R remind us of Romans 8, 28. May, 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 may it become our verse this week. All things work together for the good. And may jo Joseph put a, an exclamation point behind it. If tonight you are here carrying the guilt of sin, the only solution I can offer you is to go to Jesus who died for your sin. That if we believe in him, we're going to live. That if we confess our sins to him, he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's all you need to do. Confess your sin. And God will forgive you. You can do that tonight, right where you sit. And the guilt that destroys and, and misleads and, and robs can be let, uh, laid down at the foot of the cross. And you can go home with peace tonight. No record of wrongs. God will wipe away every tear, wash away every sin. And put every sin away from you, casting them into the ocean. Casting them be behind his back putting them as far away as the east is from the west, remembering them no more. You can, you can leave them with him and you can forget them as well because God does all things well. 
If like Jacob, you find yourself moved only by what you see and not by what you know, it's going to be hard to live a Christian life because there's a million things to turn your head. Just watch the news for three minutes and you want to turn it off and never turn it on again. But open your Bible <laughs> and begin to read God's love story to you and you won't be able to put it down. Jo 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 uh, Jacob was going to have to learn to be Israel. And he would be, and he will be. But oh, it's a tough life when you see so much loss and, and difficulty and, and you wonder what went wrong. Or you can live like Joseph. I'm sure these years were hard for him. Embarrassing. Lonely. He had to have questioned what God was doing but not enough to stop serving him. And he would rest in the one thing he knew, God was good. You meant it for evil, God meant it for good. The things that happened to me were for my good, for your good, for our good. It didn't, that, that wasn't a lesson he learned overnight, but he learned it. A and you can too. If you'll let him be the Lord and put, out, put that Romans 8, 28 in your heart and keep it in your mind. And, and, and respond to the situations that you face with it. You're going to be filled with a rest that the world can't offer you and the peace that can only come from God's hand. He's a good God. He does good things. And he knows the thoughts that he thinks towards you, and they're good for your future and for your hope.